Hello everyone. I am Vijay Vaishnav. I have done my MD in homeopathy from India. And I'm also a board certified classical homeopath. And I've been certified by the Council for Homeopathic Certification in the USA. I have been a teacher of homeopathy for a very long time. Since 1985, I have been in practice as well as in teaching. And uh, I was the head and professor of the Department of Homeopathic Materia Medica at the CMP Homeopathic Medical College in Mumbai in India. And I think I must have taught more than uh, two and a half, three thousand students uh, as a full-time faculty there. I have also been a faculty at the American Medical College of Homeopathy. Uh, this is in Arizona in the US and also a visiting faculty at the Caduceus Institute of Classical Homeopathy in California. My uh, idea is to make students and practitioners look at homeopathy and the material America and practice from a slightly different point of view. I like to integrate uh, known aspects of uh, clinical medicine, surgery, gynecology, and pathology with our homeopathic material America and the homeopathy principles, because that makes it easier for you to understand what you are doing, understand what's wrong with your patient, and also understand the pathogenesis of the remedy. Keeping this in mind, I'm going to speak about bronchial asthma today, the homeopathic management and the therapeutics, and also something about the different causes of asthma as listed in the uh, allopathic or the conventional textbooks of internal medicine. So let me share my screen first. Right. So today is going to be a session on bronchial asthma, the management and therapeutics. What are the causes of bronchial asthma? See, the, the causes described in the textbooks of medicine are very important for us as homeopaths. And we should try to correlate this information that we get from these books with the homeopathic materia medica, the repertory, and maybe even your knowledge of philosophy and use all this together to make a practical prescription. So the theme today is practical approach to bronchial asthma. Now, if you study uh, standard textbooks of uh, internal medicine, for example, Harrison's text principles and practice of internal medicine. Uh, he has, they have listed in that book, seven causes of bronchial asthma. And let's look at each of those causes, look at some of the repertorial uh, rubrics that are available for us to prescribe on for each of those causes. And then we go further from there. The most important being allergens. Allergens basically are, uh, could be any small, particles that the person inhales. It, in some people, it causes just rhinitis, and in some, it could even lead to bronchospasms. Now, there are some rubrics that are very important for us to keep in mind. One of them is uh, ailments from pollen. Following a rose cold and sanguinaria canadensis is the remedy for this. Sanguinaria canadensis is also a very important remedy for chronic bronchitis. And you might find in these people with these uh, episodes of the respiratory symptoms, they might have a circumscribed red cheek. You might also find that the cough and the breathing is relieved by eructations, which is very peculiar, or it is just sometimes relieved by passing flatus. That is peculiar to sanguinaria canadensis. Another important remedy, uh, rubric that you could look at which might help you in your uh, guide to the different remedies is hay asthma and iodium, ambrosia, arsenicum, arsiod, euphrasia, sabadilla, silica, sinapis nigra, and sticta are some of the remedies. Uh, I don't think I have the time to describe each and every remedy, but I'll just pick up one or two 
talk a few important things about them and then move on to the next rubric. So uh, ambrosia is a drug which is very important for upper respiratory allergies. And here the prescribing or the guiding symptom would be a lot of itching of the eyelids. So when you have itching of the eyelids with hay asthma, especially the spring catar and the hay fever, you could think of ambrosia as a remedy. I know that euphrasia is a remedy that most of you think of when the eyes are affected, but euphrasia has very accurate uh, lacrimation and a bland nasal discharge, which is just the opposite of LMCPA, which has accurate nasal discharge and a bland discharge from the eyes. Now, another drug that might be thought of, I like to also do a lot of relationship remedies. So you might find I digress, but I'll come back to the main subject quickly. Uh, when you have itching in the nostrils with allergies, with uh, asthma, you should think of Arendo. Arendo is a remedy which is very useful for itching in the nostrils, like Sabadilla. In Sabadilla, they start sneezing and the sneezing is loud and violent. Sometimes it's so loud that you might even find the window panes will start vibrating and shaking with the loud, violent sneezing of Sabadilla. So Sabadilla will have some sort of a tingling and inside the nostrils, as if there's a worm inside, and that itching and tingling causes the person to sneeze. Arendo is another drug you should keep in mind for that. When you have itching in the palate, the roof of the mouth, you would think of Vyathya. Vyathya would be a remedy for upper respiratory and lower respiratory symptoms where there's an itching in the palate and you find that they constantly make funny sounds to cause the, to help uh, take care of that scratching sensation that they have there. Arsenicam album, we all know as a remedy for allergies and it's got a lot of respiratory symptoms, but Arsenicum iodatum is a drug that you should keep in mind when you have what is known as sneezing, no joke. They sneeze and they sneeze and they sneeze. They, they constantly sneeze to the point that the person tells you it's no joke that I sneeze so much. Think of arsenicum iodatum for this. We had a professor of organon and philosophy when I was a student. Uh, he used to always uh, tell us that in most of the metropolitan cities in India where there's overcrowding, people are packed like sardines in the trains and the buses, they're coughing on each other, uh, no one cares about uh, hygiene and they won't cover them out sometimes because they're holding on to the rails as they are traveling. You find that a lot of the people living in metropolitan cities have been exposed to tuberculosis. So they get what is known as subclinical tuberculosis or they get the infection, but it never uh, actually uh, forms the disease. And arsenicum iodatum is a remedy according to him, which is very important because it covers this tubercular aspect and the tubercular miasm. Sinapis nigra is one more remedy you should keep in mind, especially with the hay asthma. They also have nasal polyps and nose blocks. Nose blocks affecting the left side, more in the evening, more on lying down. One other very important uh, cause of bronchial asthma is drug-induced asthma. And in the drugs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin they or ibuprofen, they are the ones which are responsible because they inhibit certain uh, enzymes. For example, here there's the carboxyoxygenase enzyme that is in, uh, inhibited, which leads to a trigger of events leading to uh, bronchospasms. Remember that they also act on the platelets and they prevent platelet aggregation. So the, the drugs that are mentioned here, this is from Fatak's repertory. I have purposely chosen different repertories to talk about because I want you to realize that just one repertory in practice is not useful. Not every repertory is complete. And you need to be looking at different rubrics from different repertories to be able to have a much better knowledge of homeopathy. So in Fatak's repertory, you find Arnica, Carbovich, Lachesis, and MacFoss. 
Now, if you look at the first three remedies here, Arnica, Carbovage, and Lachesis, all three remedies are known for hemorrhages. They get mortal patches on the skin, petechial hemorrhages, you might have ecchymosis. In case of Arnica, it could be as a result of either injury or even sepsis. Same with Carbovage and Lachesis. So you find that the action of aspirin on platelets is similar to the action of Arnica, Carbovage, and Lachesis. And you will find these three remedies are very useful for the bad effects of aspirin. And now we know why. The fourth remedy, MACFOS, is very important for us in this particular uh, disease, bronchial asthma, because Magnesia phosphorica is an antispasmodic. It prevents bronchospasms. So when you have a person who has acute bronchial asthma, a lot of spasms, and you find that he covers himself or his chest with hot, hot bags or cloths, or he has a hot water bottle there, then you know that magnesia phosphorica might be the remedy for him because magnesia phosphora has spasms that are relieved by heat. So keep this in mind. Think of sometimes uh, remedies that may not necessarily be mainstream remedies for asthma and they will still be very useful for you. The third cause given in textbooks of medicine is environment and air pollution. And here we have one rubric, dust from inhaling. And the remedy is pothos. Pothos fetidus is, we'll talk about that later when we study uh, the prescription. How do you prescribe using characteristic symptoms? So pothos is a drug which will be useful when a person has bronchial asthma after exposure to dust. Another remedy that I would think of is solanum lycopersicum. It's also known as lycopersicum esculentum. Now this has, again, a lot of sneezing, allergies from inhaling dust. Whenever they go into a dusty place or they start dusting the house, go open up or remove books from the library, they start sneezing, and then they find that the lungs also go into spasms and they get a hoarse, dry cough. Think of solanum lycoporsicum for such patients. One more important factor or cause noted in textbooks of medicine is occupational causes. And in the, in the repertories, you have certain rubrics which might be useful. For example, minor's asthma from coal dust. And the remedy is natrum arsenicosum. Now, most of us, when we think of bronchial asthma and we think of uh, in the natrum group, you would always think of natrum self first. And because we don't know much about natrum ars, we always skip this remedy or we don't even think about it. But like natrum self, natrum ars also has got, apart from the cause of dust or coal dust, it has a lot of cough with thick green expectoration, just like natrum self. And they have a sensation as if they have inhaled a lot of smoke. So when you find as patient says, I feel I've inhaled smoke and I can't cough anymore and I'm feeling tightness in the chest, think of natrum arsenicosum. In Fardis repertory, apart from natrum arsenicosum, Carius marianus also has been listed. And if you see car minus coal dust, then sulfur is listed in Fartex repertory. Bromium is a remedy you would think of when people who are working on, on the ships, when they go back home, when they land on shore, they end up getting bronchial asthma. So bromium is better in the sea air, but as soon as they come back on land, the patient's asthma seems to get worse. One very important cause, of course, is infections. Infection can be a triggering point for bronchial asthma. Most of the time, these are viral infections. And the commonest cause of a lower respiratory infection is an upper respiratory infection because it descends down into the lungs from the nose and the throat. And then the patient, it triggers a, a sort of an irritation of the bronchi and the person ends up getting bronchospasms. So some rubrics that you could look at. Worse cold from taking. The important remedies are spongia, lobelia. 
Pulsatilla and Stanum Metallicum. Now, Lobelia inflata is a remedy where you have one very peculiar symptom just before the attack of asthma. They have a peculiar prickling sensation all over the body that precedes the attack of bronchial asthma. And there will be a lot of nausea. Sometimes it resembles Ipecac, but when you have this peculiar prickling feeling all over, think of Lobelia as a drug. After measles in children, for example, measles is a viral infection. It does cause a lot of lower respiratory uh, inflammatory changes. And in some of these people, after the measles, if there's a constant irritation of the bronchi and the patient goes into bronchospasms, you could think of bromium again and think of carbo wedge. Now, carbo wedge, we all know as a remedy for a person who has gone into respiratory failure, they are, they are in, uh, they are sort of in a, a state of collapse. And it has been called a veritable corpse reviver. It's supposed to bring you back from the jaws of death. No one usually remembers or bothers to check that carbo vegetabilis is also a very good drug for upper respiratory symptoms. And if you look at the rubrics for sneezing in any of the repertories, you'll find most of those rubrics, you'll find carbo wedges either two marks or three marks. It's very important. So this is something you have to keep in mind. In Fardis repertory, again, when you have bronchial asthma with coryza, think of argentum nitricum, justitia, natrum sulf, and spongia. Now, justitia adathoda basaka, that's the full name of this remedy, is one of the drugs of Hindustan which were made popular by Dr. S.K. Ghosh, who, used, who had proved some of these uh, Indian remedies. And justitia is a drug for a lot of dry cough with wheezing and with a lot of uh, bronchospasms. Now, uh, I remember when I was a kid, there was uh, an expectorant and a cough syrup available in, uh, in the market called glycodin terp vasaka. This terp vasaka was actually the justitia. Justitia, vasaka, adatora. So this is a drug that you must study. In, in other words, I would recommend that you uh, try to get hold of a copy of Drugs of Hindustan, the original copy, not the abridged version that is there in some of the books of material medicine, and go through the provings. There's, a, there's a, an immense wealth of knowledge uh, in, in that book, which you can uh, really imbibe and use in your private practice. Exercise is another cause. Exercise induced asthma, very common. It usually happens because a person, uh, when he is exercising, and especially, especially if the air that he inhales is cold, as the cold air hits against the lining of the bronchi, it triggers a cascade of chemical reactions, which finally ends up in the form of bronchospasms. And the person develops shortness of breath, tightness of the chest, especially after they have had a run or they've done some sort of an aerobic exercise. And silica is the remedy. In Fartex repertory, you will find exertion from excessive. Think of silica. Emotional stress. So homeopaths are not the only ones who look at ailments, mind uh, or mental causes. It is now well established that emotions play a very important role in the cause of many diseases. That's why you have psychosomatic disorders. And asthma could be one of those psychosomatic disorders like hypertension, like diabetes, like irritable bowel syndrome. So, Sometimes the emotional states can trigger bronchial asthma. And if it's after anger, we all know the use of chamomilla. Chamomilla is the remedy for anger. Symptoms cause anger and anger causes symptoms. That's your chamomilla. After all emotions, you could think of either aconite, coffee, gelsemium, or ignatia. Aconite from fright, coffee from excessive joy, gelsemium from fright as well as grief. Same with Ignatia, ailments from grief. When there's ailments from excitement, think of Ambra Grisia. Ambra will be a person who cannot, who becomes really uncomfortable, 
when there are people around and in in presence of people they start coughing and they get dry short coughs <coughs> that's that's what they start doing whenever they are in in, uh, in a crowd or when they are in uh, society you will find that ambra starts getting these dry spasmodic coughs if it's a hysterical state asthma which is more hysterical then you think of moscus nux moschara or you could think of pulsatia now what's our approach as as homeopaths all the homeopaths uh would need to be more rational in their approach the first thing you need to do is after you taken the history is to examine the patient we cannot afford a no touch technique you can you don't you're not superman you don't have x ray vision that you would look into the person's body and scan and see oh he's got bronchi that are going into spasms here or he's got a patch of pneumonia you can't do that so you have to examine and you might look at the first thing you would see in general examination is that the patient is cyanosed or blue and when you have cyanosis some of the important remedies that come up would be carbovetch you could think of antimonium tartaricum there are many more but these two remedies are very important because it means that the patient is in severe respiratory distress look at the patient's internal jugular veins in the neck the neck veins are very important in some of these patients because a person with a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or a chronic obstructive lung disease finally ends up with right sided heart failure which is known as cor pulmonale and one of the remedies listed in borix materia medica and it described is arsenicum iodatum so this is a drug that you could keep in mind when a person with chronic bronchial asthma has gone into cardiac failure you should also feel the pulse if there's a pulse is paradoxus listen now to the chest and if you see that the if you can hear the ronchi the wheeze then it's very clear that the patient has bronchial asthma but sometimes the patient is actually trying his best to breathe you can see he is making an effort but the chest is silent you don't hear any sounds in the chest this is very ominous because this means the person is in severe bronchospasms and the spasms are so severe that no air can enter or exit the lungs and so if there's no air entering or exit the lungs you don't hear any breath sounds this is an emergency so you need to treat this patient as quickly as possible with some of our homeopathic emergency remedies there could be maybe specifics like uh, aspidosperma there could be specifics like bladder orientalis or there could be uh, remedies like antimonium tartaricum it could be amon carb arsenicum iodatum you need to quickly come to the right remedy and give it to the patient to get the relief finally of course you would look at the x ray of the chest to see if there's something abnormal there and if you find that the person has emphysema where the patient's lungs have got hyperinflated you would think of remedies like amon carb and antimonium arsenicosum if there's an emphysematous bulla that you see there that would indicate that this patient is at the risk of the bulla sometimes bursting and if it bursts air is going to escape outside the lung into the mediastinal cavity and the patient could have severe complications so here is a patient with just that problem that i faced in my very early years of practice i graduated in 1985 and i started seeing patients in the house in, as a houseman and then as a registrar in the hospital uh, and then later on i started a couple of years later i started my private practice and within the first 2 years of my practice this person came to me a boy maybe around 18 years old he was appearing for his 12th grade examinations very stressed about the exam and one day he he was a known case of bronchial asthma and one day in the morning uh, he said i can't breathe well and by afternoon it had increased and then he said he got a severe chest pain 
and he could not breathe at all. And the, pa the parents rushed him to my clinic because he, they all believed only in homeopathy. So these x-rays are actually the positives of the original uh, x-ray plates. So you see the, the white part is, looks black and the black part looks white. <clears throat> so when I examined him, and I used to teach medicine, clinical medicine at that time, before I uh, started teaching only material medical. So I used to teach two subjects. And as per my uh, habit, I started examining him and I found when I touched his neck region, there was a lot of crepitations, a lot of crackling under the skin. So that gave me the diagnosis that this person had subcutaneous emphysema of, under the skin of the neck. And I realized that maybe a bulla had ruptured and the air entered the mediastinum and then it escaped and came into the neck region. And the patient could not move his neck. He could not talk. He could not breathe. He had very hasty, shallow respiration. So I told them to get him immediately admitted under me at the homeopathic hospital. This is a teaching hospital. And uh, I also called up the ENT surgeon and informed him that I'm admitting a patient with this problem. I got his x-ray done and the radiologist came, sent back a note saying, you're right, this person does have subcutaneous emphysema and it's a ruptured emphysematous bulla. So it confirmed my diagnosis. And I told the ENT surgeon that we might need him to do a tracheostomy in case the patient's condition gets worse, but we would like to give a fair trial to homeopathy. And we started him on bryonia in the 200 potency based on the symptoms of slightest movement aggravates, rapid shallow breathing, and the patient uh, had was just better when you held on to it and he could not move. Three days later, we repeated the x-ray and you can see that some of the air gradually had got absorbed. And a week after he was admitted on the 24th of February, 1989, it completely cleared out. All the air got absorbed and he was only on the homeopathic remedy bryonia for this. So we discharged him about eight days after he was admitted. On the 25th or 26th, he went back home and he went to a pulmonologist. His father took him uh, to a pulmonologist to make sure everything was all, all right. And the pulmonologist refused to believe that without any allopathic intervention, homeopathy could have taken care of this. So when they showed him the x-rays and the discharge paper, he was just shocked that it was uh, such a quick and rapid response uh, could be seen with homeopathy. So uh, there are two things to remember from this case. One is you may be a junior homeopath. That doesn't mean <clears throat> you cannot treat uh, difficult cases, just be confident. Secondly, simple remedies like bryonia can also be used in conditions. You don't have to always look for all sorts of rare and unknown remedies and, and hunt for things which uh, are really uh, fancy to make a prescription. Just simple homeopathic remedies that uh, are used on a regular daily basis can work wonders. You just need to know that you have the courage to take up such cases and work with them. So how do you approach these cases? As we said earlier, we first examine the patient. Next, now we prescribe a, either a chronic constitutional remedy or the acute management. Today, I'm going to speak mainly about the acute management because that's what's important, the practical approach. How do you practically treat these patients with good results? You also need to have a, the miasmatic uh, approach or the miasmatic background. So if it's an early onset and allergic type of asthma, I would consider this to be a tubercular miasm. If it's late onset, non-allergic, it is there throughout the year, it doesn't seem to be affected by the spring or by the pollen, then most likely it is a psychotic uh, uh, asthma and I would think of some of the antipsychotic remedies. So in the acute exacerbation, what do you do? The first thing you need to do is discard the common symptoms. And what are those common symptoms? 
anxiety. Of course, he's going to be anxious because he's feeling a tightness of chest. He can't breathe out. Every breath for him seems to be his last breath. And he gets nervous. He's very scared. So anxiety is a common symptom. He becomes restless because he cannot sit in one place. He's trying to get some air. He becomes very thirsty because he's breathing through his mouth. He's losing a lot of moisture and the body wants water now. So all these are common symptoms of arsenicum album and arsenicum album should not be prescribed just because of these symptoms. He will start sweating a lot. All the accessory muscles of respiration are being used and he's going to start sweating because of that. Now carbovag and calicarb are two remedies that have a lot of sweating. Carbovag has cold sweat and calicarb, it's one of the triads of the remedy, backache, sweating and weakness. So both, both these remedies, if you're prescribing only on the basis of sweating, you're going to fail. Upright posture relieves. This is also very common in asthmatics. Either they sit up or they bend forwards. And you might find sometimes they even rock. Those are all common symptoms of the, drug, of the disease. And drugs like Calicarp, Arsenicum album are no longer considered for this patient. Worse at midnight, again, is a common symptom. So arsenic is next. Worse lying down, again, is a common symptom. Better in the open air, better by being fanned. These are all common symptoms of the disease and they are not going to be used in your prescription. So what do we use? We use the characteristic symptoms. Like for example, the cause, ailments from, when you have a psychological cause, when there's a severe fright and the patient has developed symptoms, think of aconite, ailments from joy and happy news and the patient goes into a state of bronchospasms, think of coffee, gelsemium, ignatia are again remedies for ailments from grief, ailments from fright. Palladium, when she feels she has been slighted, she has a big ego and she feels that people have to give her a lot of respect. When she doesn't get that, she might sometimes end up getting bronchospasms. Palladium is also, by the way, a good remedy for ovarian tumors. The next important characteristic for us is to look at how the weather affects your patient. If the asthma comes on from a change of weather, you would think of arsenicum album, you would think of chelidonium, you would think of dalcamara. In dry, cold weather, Aconite, causticum, hepperself, and nux vomica are to be thought of. You will never use, for example, these four remedies in places like uh, Mumbai, where it's always humid. So in all the coastal areas in the, in the US, for example, I would not think of giving uh, these four remedies in places like Florida, which are always humid. So if it's dry and cold, that's when you think of these remedies. In spring, aggravation in spring, allium sepa and lachesis. Summer aggravation, bryonia, natrum carb, natrum carb, uh, natrum mur. Uh, Portophila, of course, is mainly for summer diarrheas. But asthma in summer, one very important drug is cephalinum. Don't forget cephalinum for that uh, summer aggravation. In the warm, moist, relaxing weather, Usually in places like Mumbai, it happens in the months of uh, end of May, early June, when you find that it has rained and now it's very hot again and it's very sultry. It's very hot and moist and humid. Carbovage, epicac and gelsemium are the remedies for this sort of a weather. You will find this maybe in uh, Louisiana in the US or Florida, for example, where you might have warm, moist, relaxing weather. In extremely damp and wet weather, when the person comes with bronchial asthma, nitrum self, dalcamara, and thuya. Rustox basically is not that important for the respiratory tract, but I just added that because you should not forget the importance of Rustox in dampness. In autumn, think of China or Sincona. Now, as we continue to use the characteristics in the acute exacerbation, 
there are other things that you could look for like the time relationship then the peculiar modalities and the alternating states and finally if there are any rare remedies that you can think of so let's look at the time modalities a person who has bronchial asthma early in the morning at 2 you could think of arsenic amalgam calibicromicum and rumex if it's at 3 in the morning all the calis you can think of thuya you can think of cuprum metallicum cuprum is very important for asthma it's a very important metal which has got spasms and that will help in the treatment of bronchial asthma 4 to 5 in the morning natrum sulf and stannum metallicum stannum is a drug which has got a specific affinity for the chest and they often complain of weakness felt inside the chest everything feels weak and empty inside the chest and if they bring up an expectoration it will be sometimes sweet or salty 5 am is again cali iodatum when symptoms are worse at daybreak you think of nakswamika symptoms are worse between 10 and 11 in the morning ferrum metallicum could be thought of most of the time we think of natrumur and sulfur whenever someone says i have an 11 am aggravation but this is another drug that you should keep in mind if it's at noon then again arsenicum album and nobelia inflata can be thought of and if a person has evening aggravation you would think of pulsatilla now as you know i have not mentioned night aggravation here because if you remember i had told you that worse at night is a common uh, symptom of bronchial asthma and why is it so common we'll talk about that later but first let's look at this rubric in the chapter of generalities midnight after arsenicum album is 3 marks very often many of you must have given arsenicum album to patients of bronchial asthma when they have come with an aggravation at midnight or around midnight and you have failed or you have found that the patient only slightly improved and that's it it didn't they didn't seem to get better after that why did that happen that happened because you prescribed on a common symptom we have something known as a circadian cycle in our body everything has a rhythm and this biological clock takes care of everything in our body so our blood pressure is lowest in the morning and it increases by evening our body temperature is low in the morning and it's slightly elevated in the uh, evening our red blood corpuscles white blood cells all of them have this biological clock and they the levels will go up and down at different times of the day similarly our serum cortisol levels are also following this biological clock and cortisone you all know is the treatment for, bron for bronchial asthma so as long as the cortisol levels are good in the body it is like a protection against bronchial asthma and against all allergies and the levels of serum cortisol are the lowest around midnight so that is the time when you are most likely to get allergy attacks or bronchial asthma so midnight aggravation is a common symptom now if you look at this chart it says that 3 to 6 in the morning is the time when you have the highest levels of serum cortisol in our body so that is the time when you have no business to get bronchial asthma because you are well protected so Three <clears throat> a.m. here, for example, calicarb, calinitricum, cuprum metallicum, natrum sulf, stannum metallicum, cali iod, thuya, amon carb. These are all remedies which are worse between three and six in the morning. These are going to be the characteristics that you look for. So, if a person has three to six a.m. aggravation. these remedies become much more important for us to use now this is something that <clears throat> again this rubric tells you the same thing all the calis nakswamika rumex sulfur thuya natrum sulf they all are uh, worse between 2 and 5 3 and 6 or 3 and 4 think of these remedies when a person comes with aggravation 
early morning between three and four. Now Kent also found that his patients were also not responding well when he gave Arsenicum album. And in his lectures on homeopathic philosophy, he writes, a peculiar asthmatic condition is found in psychosis and arsenic appears to be indicated for the symptoms, but it only relieves. It does not control the predisposition. It lacks like aconite in acute diseases and only ameliorates for a moment. So he found this a problem and he didn't know why it was happening because the knowledge of physiology was not as uh, strong as it is now. A lot of new uh, things have come to light. So he explained it in the form of miasms. And he said that this is because there was a strong miasm in the background and because psychosis was at, as at play. And you have to follow up with Thuya or Nitrum Self. Now remember, these are the remedies which are worse between three and five or three and six. And they are the ones that help to cure when arsenicum album doesn't seem to help much. So he tried to explain it with the help of miasms, but you can now understand why arsenic sometimes fails because you're prescribing on a common modality. Midnight aggravation is a very common modality in bronchial asthma. So going back to the characteristics, we just talked about the modality of bronchial asthma. So what are the peculiar modalities on which you can prescribe? Worse after eating is a, is a modality that you could think of. The patient eats and he gets a bronchospasm. Think of Califos, Nuxwamica, Pulsitia. Better by eructations, Carbovedge, Nuxwamica, Sanguinaria canadensis. I talked about Sanguinaria earlier. Better by stools is Pothos. Pothos, again, we talked about earlier. Uh, and I said I'm going to give some reference to it later. And this is that reference. Better by lying down is Sorinum. And this reminds me of a patient that we had in our outpatient clinic when I used to teach at uh, the, the homeopathic uh, college and hospital in Mumbai. She was in obvious respiratory distress. She must be in her mid th late 30s, possibly. She was actually finding it difficult to breathe. She seemed to be very cold. She had a sweater on. It was in the month of May, I think end of May, which is very hot in Mumbai. And her husband had also made her wear a shawl and she was sh sitting there shaking and she was breathless. And I felt that with so many students around and so many interns sitting there, she's obviously not going to feel very comfortable with her breathing. And we decided we'll admit her right away, sent her to the ward on the first floor. And uh, I sent one intern to take a detailed history and keep it ready so that after I finished with the outpatient pay, uh, clinic, I would go up to the wards, see her and make a prescription. Maybe about an hour later, I went to the wards to check, out, check up on her. And what do I find? She's lying in bed and she seemed to be completely asymptomatic. And the intern was sitting there talking to her and taking her history. So I asked the intern, what happened? Did you give something to her? Or did they take any of those inhalers that her uh, pulmonologist had prescribed? Or did she take any tablets? Uh, or was she on steroids that has made her suddenly become completely normal? And the intern said, no, as soon as she came, uh, they gave her, allotted the bed to her. She sat there and when she lay down, within a few minutes, she was very comfortable. And she was able to answer all my questions. So this was a peculiar modality, better by lying down. So a patient with bronchial asthma who was extremely chilly, worse sitting up and better by lying down. Sorinum was a remedy. We gave her Sorinum right away on this peculiar modality. And I think just a couple of doses were given to her during her stay in the hospital. We had it investigated. We found everything was fairly good. We discharged her and then she kept following up in the outpatient clinic. And over those next few months, I think just a couple of more doses of sorinum were given to her as and when needed, but she recovered completely and she had no major episodes of bronchial asthma after that. 
Worse after talking is Drosera. Worse after laughing, this is given in Fatak's repertory, and that's Arsikam album. Worse in foggy weather, I'm sure you all know, is Hypericum. And in Fatak's repertory, you have one very peculiar and important modality: better by smoking. Most of the people who have bronchial asthma are told to stop smoking because tobacco smoke aggravates the the shortness of breath. And this person. in mercury is better by smoking so that becomes a very peculiar modality for us <clears throat> so we had this uh, student who requested me requested me to go with her and visit her brother who was in acute respiratory distress he uh, was uh, so during just after lunch time from the college we decided to go and see him and he had been feeling shortness of breath for quite some time now and when i went there i found that uh he was standing holding on to the door and he was talking to me and made i made him sit down so that i could uh listen to his uh breath sounds he said i can't do that i get very breathless if i sit or lie down i must stand and i have to take deep breaths to be able to breathe well so we noted a few of his symptoms and these are the rubrics i took periodicity coming complaints coming at the same hour so every afternoon around i think it was around 2:30 or 3 in the afternoon this was a long time ago so i don't know the exact time but i think it was around 2 or 2:30 or 3 in the afternoon that he would get this shortness of breath and it was happening every day at the same time he also had this respiration deep desire to breathe respiration difficult eating emulates the respiration difficult lying while aggravates difficult sleep after difficult sitting on and difficult stand must compelled to stand when we repertorized the two first two remedies were deep acting polycress and the third one was interesting it was cedron and it covered all the rubrics though of course just one mark but however i thought this is the remedy we should give because it covered his very important peculiar modality and that was the time modality coming at the same time every day also he had this peculiar symptom of compelled stand to so he had to stand to breathe and he was actually holding on to the uh, door and standing door knob and sidron covers that too so based on that even though all the rubrics uh, were covered and they were all in one mark they were not really two or three marks i still in, decided to give cedron and that helped break this whole cycle and he has never had asthma till now she that uh, student then became my assistant for some time in my clinic and then they are more like family friends and we been we found that his asthma has been well controlled in fact he's never had the breathing problems again so coming back to the acute exacerbation we use the characteristics like the alternating states if the asthma alternates with eruptions you would think of heparsulf calmia and sulfur if it alternates with urticaria you could think of caladium if it uh, uh, alternates with headaches think of glonoin and calibrom if gout and asthma alternate think of sulf and benzoic acid and if it alternates with diarrhea at night so when the patient's diarrhea at night and breathlessness during the daytime cali carbonicum should be the remedy you should think of the other thing that you have to keep in mind is sometimes you might need to use rare remedies in the acute exacerbation no remedy is rare all remedies have equal status for me a remedy is only rare because you don't know anything about it so if you have studied the remedy it no longer becomes rare for you and it becomes as important as any of the other polycrest remedies and some of the important respiratory remedies that are so called rare remedies are antimonium arsenicosum my first prescription of antimonium arsenicum uh, arsenicosum was a synthetic prescription so i prescribed it in a person who had 
a few antim tart symptoms and a few arsenicum album symptoms. And I thought instead of giving two remedies, why not give antim ars, which basically has both those uh, elements and it worked very well. And then when you study the remedy, you realize it's a very good drug for emphysema. It's a good drug for a lot of uh, cough, which persists, which is worse. Respiration and symptoms are worse in the evening and they are worse after eating. Recently, my mother, she's 93 years old, went into cardiac failure, congestive heart failure. She has chronic obstructive lung disease. And she refused to get admitted in the hospital because the last time she went there during the COVID pandemic, she was in isolation. She went not because of COVID infection, but because she had, again, an acute exacerbation of her respiratory symptoms. But none of us were allowed to meet her. She didn't get the, she was not given the food that she normally gets at home. And uh, she was getting more of the food that she gets, that you would eat in any other American hospital. And she just refused to go. So we, I talked to the cardiologist and uh, he is aware that I am a homeopath and I, that I've been seeing patients in India as well as here. And he said, why don't you also uh, try homeopathy along with uh, the dose of uh, diuretics that he had prescribed earlier. So Antim Ars was a remedy I thought for her and it has helped her because her oxygen, she was on oxygen throughout the day, 24 hours. And if you stop the oxygen, the O2 sat used to drop to 84, 85 and she would visibly get breathless. After we started the Antim Ars and of course she was still continuing with her uh, previous uh, conventional treatment that that was anyway going on. In spite of that, she went into cardiac failure, mainly because I think she had a lot of salty things. She used to crave salt sometimes. And then that led to uh, the congestive heart failure. So we stopped her salt. We curtailed her fluid intake and we added anti-Mars. And within a week or maybe 10 days, she was completely off the daytime oxygen. And... Uh, her oxygen saturation after walking around in the house would drop to 93. And most of the time, it used to remain between 95 and 97 when it rest. So uh, anti-Mars is a remedy that you must not uh, neglect. It is no longer rare for me. It has never been rare for me, but it helped prove once again that these smaller remedies are very useful. Aspidosperma or Quebraco is also called the digitalis of the lungs. It is like a lung tonic and it helps in the oxygenation. It helps in the exchange of gases in the lungs. In fact, uh, it is what Viagra is for primary pulmonary hypertension. So Viagra was initially a drug developed for pulmonary hypertension, but then they also found it had a good effect on erectile dysfunction and it is much more commonly known amongst laypersons for its effect on ED, then on PPH or primary pulmonary hypertension. So Aspidosperma has got pulmonary hypertension. It has also got pulmonary venous thrombosis. So this remedy is something you should look for and you should prescribe when you have such a pathology in a patient. Bladder orientalis is a remedy which I uh, remember very well uh, because there was a case that we had in our hospital where uh, a, she was basically uh, had all the features of arsenicum album and she was not doing very well. And we are, of course, not prescribed on the common symptoms of arsenic. We are prescribed on the peculiar symptoms, her emotional state, and she had some other skin conditions that uh, also fit with what was seen in arsenicum album. But we thought that to help boost her response, why not give one of the mother tinctures to her? And we decided that instead of giving it to her orally, why not give it as a nebulization? It was an experiment. And we gave Blata Orientalis to her through the nebulizer. So there was a direct uh, action of Blata Orientalis on the lungs itself. It went straight 
through the nebulizer into her respiratory tract and not through the mouth and the, the stomach and then the absorption and then the effect. And we found that it worked wonderfully. Bladder orientalis anyway is, has a relationship with arsenicum album. So it was a related remedy that was given at a local level and it brought about changes. So uh, this is an innovation in homeopathic practice, dispensing in a different way, instead of giving it either orally or rubbing it on the skin or olfaction, one more way of prescribing or, or giving or delivering the dose to a patient would be through nebulization. And this remedy is worth looking at. Then of course, we know Grandelia has got aggravation at night during sleep. Lobelia has got, as we said earlier, the prickling sensation before the attack of bronchial asthma. Then, of course, you have constitutional drugs. I'll just gloss over them because our aim today is practical approach to an acute uh, attack of homeopathic of uh, bronchial asthma and how homeopathic medicines would be useful. So these are some of the common remedies that you can think of as constitutional drugs. Or you could think of the anti-miasmatic drugs like thuja, medorinum, tuberculinum, sorinum. But what is more important is what next? Relationship of remedies. This is extremely important when you're, when you're dealing with any condition. One of the commonest mistakes that homeopaths make is any person who comes with rattling in the chest, with cough and with breathing uh, issues, the only remedy they can think of is antimonium tartaricum. Remember, antimonium tartaricum has a death rattle. They're drowning in their own secretions. and There's a lot of bubbling of air through the, the fluid that's collected in the lungs. So they are in pulmonary edema or they are uh, having a lot of chron chronic bronchitis and gone into congestive heart failure. You will never see them come to your office or to your clinic. In fact, you will have to go and visit them either in their house because they cannot, they cannot move. They are in the last stage of their life with the amount of respiratory distress that they have. Or you might have to visit them in the hospital, in the ward where they are admitted. So antim tart is a remedy that doesn't come as the first prescription. And unfortunately, most homeopaths, when they hear some rattling in the chest, they would give antim tart. I would prefer to think of Heparself, where a person has a dry, hoarse, barking cough initially, but later you will find that the cough becomes more loose, more rattling, patient is very chilly, they'll bring up an, a phlegm which might have, a, which can be offensive, smells like old cheese. Ammonium carbonicum or ammon carb is a drug like antim tart for 3 a.m. aggravation, but antim tart has difficult expectoration, ammon carb has easy expectoration. And ammon carb is mainly for emphysema, antim tart is for chronic bronchitis. So here is where your knowledge of pathology is also very important for us. Cali self, like antim tart and the other calis, has 3 a.m. aggravation. But cali self will have a easy expectoration, which is yellow. And cali self has got a lot of thirst. They have a burning thirst for water. While antim tart will have absence of thirst. Antim tart has a thick, white coated tongue. Cali self will have a yellowish coating on the tongue. So it's easy to differentiate. But if you are stuck with antim tart, you're not going to look for other remedies. And you might miss some of the other remedies, which might help prevent the patient from going into, from an antim tart state into a carbo wedge or an opium state. Bromium is another remedy that you should think of. Now, bromium is like all halogens, it has an action on the respiratory tract. It has an action on the lungs, the bronchi. And in case of bromium, also the larynx and the trachea. And there's a lot of collection of secretions in the larynx and the trachea. So when they cough, the loose sounds that you hear come more from the lung. You can hear them as if they are more in the larynx, in the laryngeal region, and not really coming from the lungs. So that would be a good indicator for you. Very often you find Ipecac is a remedy that precedes antim tart. Both have an action of the pneumogastric nerve, both or the vagus nerve. But in case of Ipecac, you'll have initially a dry spasmodic cough 
and a lot of nausea, a lot of nausea and retching, which does not relieve even after vomiting. And Tim Tart also will have a lot of nausea and vomiting because it's a pneumogastric nerve, but it is in the second stage. When the mother comes and tells you, my child was coughing a lot, and now the coughing has become much less, don't be happy. It's most likely that from the epicac state, the patient has gone into the antim tart state. And then antim tart is followed by cupromet uh, carbovage or opium. Epicac can be followed by cuprometallicum. Epicac has spasms, so does cuprometallicum. And they are related to each other. So let's look at antim tart, carbovage, and opium. These are the three remedies that you would think of when a person has gone into severe respiratory distress, like post-COVID or during COVID, many people were going into respiratory failure or after severe bronchospasms in this case. So how do you differentiate these remedies? Because the patient most likely is not going to be able to speak. He's in respiratory distress or he might actually be on the verge of being almost unconscious. You have to rely on what the patient's uh, friends and relatives tell you, or more likely, you'll have to look at different aspects on examination. So here, examination is very important for us. And that's another thing that I would like to stress. Examine your patient. Look for your findings through examinations. So if you look at the appearance of the patient in general, Antim Tart is pale and blue, Carbovage is blue, and opium, the face is dusky red. As you look at the face now, you'll see that there's a fan-like motion of the alanasi that is seen in antimonium tartaricum. Carbovage is gasping for breath. And in case of your opium, the lower jaw hangs down. He's in such a state, there's a lot of relaxation and paralysis, and the lower jaw seems to hang down. That's how they appear. It, it seems to be so relaxed. Now look at the wakefulness, the state of wakefulness. Antim tart is still in a drowsy state while your carbovage is going from stupor into a comatose state and opium, you find he's in complete coma. It seems like he's in a heavy, stupid sleep. You cannot rouse him out of this. Now, as you listen to them, you come closer and listen to the uh, breath sounds without the stethoscope. You can hear the death rattle in the case of antim tart. In case of carbovage, <coughs> wheezing. And in case of opium, <coughs> stertorous respiration. He's in such a relaxed, paralyzed state that the lower, the soft palate vibrates every time he breathes in and out and it produces that sound like snoring. Now, as you are looking at him closely, look at the sweat. You will find that antim tart seems to be sweating on the face and it's cold. Carbovage sweats all over and it's a cold sweat, but the head feels hot to touch and your opium will have a hot sweat. Now look at the tongue. The antim tart tongue, as I told you earlier, is white coated, it's thick white and pasty. The carbovage tongue is white or yellowish brown, and you might find aphthe on the tongue. In the case of opium, it's a black and paralyzed tongue. The pulse now, you feel the pulse. It's a rapid, weak and trembling pulse in antim tart. Carbovage is in a state of collapse, so the pulse is almost imperceptible. You can't feel it. But in case of opium, even though he is in the comatose state, the pulse is full and slow. You can feel it rise and slowly fall down. Now you can auscultate the chest. And when you auscultate, you'll see crepitations in case of, uh, you'll hear the crepitations in antim tart because of the pulmonary edema. In case of carbovage, you'll hear a lot of wheezing and rattling both. And again, in opium, there'll be a lot of crepitations. So just looking at the patient, examining the patient can help you distinguish between three important remedies and the last stages of life. And you might be able to get this patient, patient out of the jaws of death.
sometimes you would prescribe arsenicum as the remedy in the acute state. And then it is followed by natron self or thuya. Ipecac and arsenic sometimes might uh, be needed following one another. And that's a relationship you should keep in mind. Nuxwamika is often the first remedy you start with. Sometimes they mention that the first remedy to start with in a person in a soric case could be Nuxwamika or after the abuse of a lot of drugs, you would think of again Nuxwamika. But I would give it mainly because the patient has symptoms of Nuxwamika in the respiratory tract. And Nuxwamika can be followed by lycopodium. Nuxwamika can be followed by sulfur. Nuxwamika is followed by carbovich as well as by calicarb. So these are the remedies that you might keep in mind when a person has Nuxomica as the initial remedy that was given to them. Now, carbovage and calicarb also have a specific affinity for each other. Carbovage is the acute of calicarb. In fact, when you have a calicarb constitution that does not seem to respond or react to the remedy, it means that the patient's susceptibility has been so poor that they cannot respond. That is the time carbovage has to be given. Carbovage will so arouse the susceptibility that now as afterwards, when you follow up with Kalikar, you find that the patient starts reacting again and the asthmatic symptoms start settling down. In some of your patients, pulsatilla might be the, the remedy which you start with, and it can be followed by Caliself or Cilicia. Sometimes you give tuboculinum, and then that is followed by Pulsatia, and then Caliself and Silica. You must also remember that there are certain plants which have a very strong uh, mineral analog, and they are very important for us in the respiratory tract. Like for example, Allium Sipa is the acute plant remedy, and the deep acting constitutional or mineral remedy could be phosphorus. Epicac and cuprum metallicum both have got spasms. Also, epicac is a plant that thrives best in soil, which is rich in copper. So it seems to have absorbed a lot of copper. And so you have a lot of the cuprum met symptoms like the spasms, like the cramps. Pulsatilla and Kali self. So the Kali self is the biochemic pulsatilla. Also, pulsidea and silica. Silica, again, is important because the plant pulsatilla grows best in soil which is sandy and rich in silica. So again, they have a biological relationship. Sanguinera candidensis can be followed or it's, uh, the complementary is phosphorus and thuya and natrum self. So apart from just prescribing and looking, just making the first prescription, you should also be ready for the next step. And that is the remedy relationship. What do you give next? Same remedy has to be continued. And when, you, when do you give the chronic constitutional drug? By and large, as a rule, at the end of the acute attack, you're more likely to see all the constitutional symptoms come up and it makes, makes the constitutional remedy very clear. And most of the time, the constitutional remedy that is now clearly uh, seen to you in the patient will be related to the acute remedy. So you must know your relationship of remedies very well. You must also learn how to differentiate the different remedies of the Materia Medica so that you make the right prescription. The plan is to be as perfect as possible in the most practical way so that the patient is relieved as quickly as possible. Thank you very much, all of you, for attending today's session. And uh, I hope you found it as uh, interesting as I enjoyed talking about this session. Uh, if you have ever any questions or you need to reach out to me, my email address is office at drweishnow.com. And my website is www.drvaishnav.com. That's D-R-V-A-I-S-H-N-A-V.com. Thanks once again. And wish you all the best for the future. <laughs>